Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Manufacturing Leads podcast with me, Mark Bracknell, Managing Director of Theo James Recruitment. Been a few weeks since my last episode, a few weeks out, but over the moon to come back with a, a brilliant episode with Liam Forbes, the General Manager of Soil Machine Dynamics based in Wallsend. A tremendous company and a, a tremendous interviewee and one I was really looking forward to and certainly did not disappoint. Liam is a in my eyes, a born leader. This was a real, you know, back to proper discussions regarding management, what makes a manager, the difference between a leader and a manager, how a leader must have vision and purpose, the importance of, of self-awareness as a leader. And he gave excellent tips around exactly what he's implemented in his journey as a leader um, regarding self-awareness and how he's improved his management style. We talked about how important training is as leaders. We talk in detail and discussions behind people who suddenly find themselves in leadership and management roles simply because they've been good at that particular trade, but they don't have any management leadership training behind them or necessarily that stays a skill set behind that. And he gave some great tips about what to do if you're in that situation. This was just a really, really um, enjoyable, but it felt a very important discussion, which I think is going to help a lot of managers at any single level, whether you're new, starting out industry, or you've been a manager for some time and looking for some uh, some inspiration. So thank you, Liam, this is great. It's gonna help a lot of people. Um, please, please uh, uh, subscribe, like, comment. Um, it's really important to me to make sure we, we get more subscribers and followers to the channel. And obviously we will continue to get great people like Liam on the podcast. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the episode. Great stuff. So uh, a warm welcome today to Liam Forbes onto the podcast. He's the general manager of the service division of uh, Soil Machine Dynamics. And uh, and my first podcast in a few weeks, so I've had a little bit of a break and I'm over the moon to come back with a, a brilliant guest. So uh, welcome, Liam. How are you? I'm good, thanks. And thank you very much for asking me to come on. Um, uh, it's, a, it's my first podcast, so it's all new to me. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the conversation and discussion we're going to have. Good stuff. Me too. But so I always kick it off the same question. What does it mean to you to be a leader? So for me, um, I guess it's partly kind of a research and coming into this. I had a look online and I did find a quote from Henry Ford that really aligns to my thinking on it. And it's that you don't need to hold a position to be a leader. And for me, what that means is um, I think leadership is very much about how you um, inspire those that work for you and the, what you work with. Um, and I looked into a couple of things, and some things are that, in terms of attributes, you very much need to be a guide. So knowing where you're trying to go and helping people get there. Um, I had a boss years ago who used to use a phrase that um, I'm not the only person being paid lots of money here to make decisions and come up with thinking. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really pertinent. I think as a leader, it's about trying to get the best out of people. If we look at successful teams and businesses, um, and I think it was Steve Jobs said that we don't pay lots of money for intelligent people to tell them what to do. We pay them that money for them to tell us. Yeah. And I think that's really important. So it's about getting um, the best out of people, helping and encouraging them and coaching them to start making better decisions in the business context. Um, so that's very much, I think, about the guiding piece. There's the chief piece, which is about knowing exactly what you are and what you're doing and where you're going and having a view on that. Um, and some of the reading that I've done on the leadership piece, it talked to also about the third element being being like a tree. So that's about putting down the good foundation so that when things are stormy, that those foundations hold you firm. Um, I've always taken the view that there is a real difference between a good manager and a good leader. I've had a lot of good managers. I would say I've had far fewer good leaders. Um, they were great at managing things, but leadership is more than just managing activities. It includes people and the people's at the fore of that, I think, in leadership. And I've, from my background working in Ministry of Defence, um, I had quite a lot of involvement with the military. And I would, like it, I would liken it to, you can have a really good manager who will come up with a plan for the battle, um, the difference in a really good leader is when they get out of that trench and go over, his team will follow him regardless. And I think that, for me, is the, one of the real differentiators. It's that people will f not blindly follow a person, but they will follow a person because they implicitly trust them. 
And I think ultimately, in terms of what a leader is, at the heart of that has to be about honesty and integrity. They have to be honest with people and honest with themselves in particular. And that integrity has to be core to what they believe in. Um, and I guess as part of that, you can form the view that you have a sense of purpose. And if we all have a common sense of purpose, then hopefully all our uh, all the other things start to align. So I guess maybe a long-winded way of putting it, but it is about fundamentally inspiring people and getting the best from them so that you get a common uh, success. Of that. that. And really like that. And there's so, so many things there that that I found so interesting. Actually, I love analogy as well with the with the terms of the, the military and the difference between leader and, uh, and manager. And you, you're so right. I think, and you said it right at the start as well, that, the importance of having a vision and i think as a manager or a leader or whatever your title is there's probably situations where you lose that along the way and if if you lost the vision yourself then how can you expect people to to follow you yeah and i think that's ties directly back to that honesty and integrity and sense yeah. of purpose um when i first took over this role i remember chatting to the team um we were a lesser part of the business and i remember saying that we can all sit here and we can lick our wounds and say poor us, or we can ultimately stand up and be counted. And the way to be counted is by doing a really good job in developing the business in the way that we see that it's the appropriate way for what our clients need and to truly add value to those clients. Through that, you get recognition through revenue, et cetera, and through time, the service part of the business becomes recognised in its entirety. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, it's about not being a victim, I guess, as part of that. Um, and actually taking accountability for what you're trying to achieve. And I guess that's part of being a leader as well, taking ownership of the challenge and making sure that you drive for that challenge. Yeah, 100%. And like you mentioned, it, it's a good leader will, will enable people and they'll facilitate. And I think that's the misconception where people just think you tell people what to do, or actually, if you tell people what to do, they, they really do it. You've, you've got to persuade yeah. them or, or let them come up with the ideas in the first place. No, absolutely. And I guess, so part of the coaching that I'm receiving at the moment, it's exactly that. It's about encouraging others to make decisions, not tell them what the decision should be. Yeah. Um, so part of that's about being clear and concise in what the objective is. Um, I often describe things in terms of how I want to be as a leader, that we need to get to be where it is. Um, and fundamentally, I want to help shape what the journey to be is, but I don't want to dictate it. Because we all know that you put that same problem to a multitude of different people based upon their knowledge and experience and skill set, they'll probably all get to be. They might all get there in different ways. Some will be efficient, some won't. Some will be better than others. But the fact is they all got to it. Um, and being a good leader is trying to help when it's slightly strained or it's inefficient, helping bring them back to a more uh, productive way to get to the, the end solution. And and we'll go into it as well, but like you say, your time with the Ministry of Defence and working with the military, how how different do you think that mentality of leadership and management was com compared to you know engineering and manufacturing, you know, day to day now, you know, however however many years on? Um, I think massively different. The military world, and to a certain extent, the civil service and ministry of defence that support it, um, is very very uh, hierarchical. Yeah. At the end of the day, if a colonel in the army says do that, the entire the entire brigade will go and do that, whether it's the right, wrong, or by, uh, the right thing to do as such. Um, I think in industry, we need to get people um, to buy into what it is we're trying to achieve and to help shape the solution and the direction as to how we're getting there. Because otherwise, you're... It probably comes back to the adage you can lead a horse to water, but if you've not convinced them that the trough is what they need to drink from, they're not going to look, uh, drink out of that trough. They'll keep going to where they know they can get water. Um, and that might be the right or wrong thing, but as a leader, that's another part is actually being able to accept when what you're trying to achieve maybe isn't the right direction and being willing to put your hand, which ultimately comes back to my point about integrity. You know, we should we shouldn't as leaders be uh, be scared to admit that we got it wrong. Um, it's part of the discussions I have with a lot of people in my team. I will often talk, and certainly when I took the role, and I've said it multiple times since, I don't promise that I'll fix all the problems. What, what I promise you 
is it will try and make it a better work environment for us to work in and for it to be more efficient and better for everybody. Um, clearly, some things that are beasts for some people, if you were to spend the time to fix that problem, it's maybe a minuscule part of the role. And the time and effort versus the effect that you get from it is probably, uh, there's no real value in doing it. So uh, there's definitely a, a stark difference, I think, in those environments. And and you've had a, a brilliant career. You know, you look back now, so a lot to go, but in terms of what you've done and you were in, in important roles very early on, was yeah. that a conscious thing for you to want to try and get in or is this the way it happened? How did you? Um, to a certain extent, certainly a lot of elements of my career have been through... Uh, fortune to a certain extent but ultimately you don't just get gifts you have to then prove yourself and work them so if I start right back at the start for me um, I recall going to go out to play with some mates at the age of 15 me mum asking me where I thought I was going and me saying well I'm going out with the, to meet the lads your aunt has sent through an application form for an apprenticeship and it was with a view of getting an apprenticeship at a naval base where if I was successful, I would go and live with my aunt to give me access to college and to the base because I lived about 70-odd miles away and it wasn't easy to get to. So I filled out that form, went through the process, was successful, got that apprenticeship. So that was the first, if you like, luck part. And um, Clearly, I had to get the right levels of grades. I had to pass the aptitude tests and, and prove myself. Um, i done a four-year indentured apprenticeship. I'm a fit turner to trade. So I used to fix a lot of machinery and steam plant in, a, in the naval base. I'd been out my time uh, maybe a year or so um, and my friendship group had kind of changed because I was living more through where I worked and I got involved with a few people who were at university at the time and they basically convinced me that I was bright enough to go and do a degree and I'd already by that point formed the opinion that I can't change the problems I see at my level from my level. I have to be higher up that chain. So ironically, I went for to uni to ultimately come back and try and run the part of the business that I worked in. I've never since worked there other than on a placement as a student. Um, that then, having went to, uh, I then applied for university, was successful in getting there. Um, I was lucky that I was supported in part by the Ministry of Defence. So they had a, a big training uh, department at the time based down south. So I got access to summer placements in different environments. Um, I was guaranteed to be taken on at their graduate scheme as long as I achieved, a, 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 as long as I was successful in obtaining a degree. Um, if I fast forward to the back end of my university time, I've done a few placements. I went on a placement down to Bristol, which is the hub for where all the MOD's procurement and support activities are. I think it's now called DSE, DSE and I, but at the time it was the Defence Procurement Agency. And I got chatting to two previous graduates who were worked in a project team. And I've to this day, I don't think I've ever spoke to anybody that was more enthusiastic uh, enthusiastic about their jobs. Right. Um, they worked in project teams where the equipment that they were doing was uh, kind of front-end technology. The environment they were involved with was um, lots of different special projects. And it was all very intriguing. So the following year, I managed to obtain a placement there, which then became my job. So again, a bit fortuitous that I was down in Bristol at that time because I was actually meant to have worked in Glasgow that summer, but the placement fell through at the last moment yeah. and I had to find something quickly. Um, within a couple of years of being, or within three years of working hard down there, um, ultimately I applied for my boss's job and was declined. An interviewer was told that there was a large number of applicants. There was only three interviews and I was fourth in the list. Um, and that disheartened me slightly. I then shaped a view that I was sitting in a massive organisation, that progress was was very much based upon your ability to demonstrate through training and using the right language. Um, I've always had the view that it's your merit and worth that should be, cre should be credited and picked up on. So I decided to leave the Ministry of Defence and the comfortable world of the civil service um, with other people in my mind uh, putting forward that you'll never be able to be a success in the outside world because it's real out there. Um, 
I mean, within MOD, my first role, my first contract that I managed was a million pound lithium ion power system, the first ever brought any service. And at the time, at 27, I was sitting thinking, 27 year old, and it's this million pound job. That's a big old thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was then successful in joining Babcock International Group as a project manager. Um, ironically, I thought I was going for a job up in Scotland, but it was actually in Tyneside in Newcastle. Yeah. Um, but that role, it was the first time, it was a basically we designed offshore vessels, um, typically specialist vessels, tankers, um, floating production storage offloading system uh, vessels for the oil and gas industry. That role morphed in the seven years that I was there. I quickly became responsible for both projects and commercial activities, so in terms of the commercial returns on projects, etc. Um, I had a spell where we had a small office in Isla White. I became general manager for that office prior to it being wound up and closed down. Um, the last couple of years in Babcock, I was asked to try and help develop the strategy for a potential push into new markets. So the area that I was tasked with looking at was renewables. So that was supported by various directors and other people within the business, but very much about shaping what could Babcock do in this market. Um, at the time, that was very much an emerging market. Um, large scale wind farms, we're talking 15 years ago, weren't quite there. There had been some small round one and round two wind farms in the UK. Um, so that gave me a lot of exposure to business development, shaping things from the policy side and involvement with people at the Carbon Trust and how that influences your business. Um, I happened to see an opportunity which is actually in the site next door to where I currently sit, which was to go in as a deputy project manager for large EPC contracts. Um, again, I, like lots of people do, I just was keeping tabs on the job market. I mean, I read the advert that they were looking for a project manager with, with extensive experience in managing uh, FPSO design. That's pretty much what my office along the road done. Yeah. Uh, I think I tick all the boxes here and was successful in getting that. And for me, that was a point where I thought this is actually a career, sorry, a CV building role. I had managed lots of smaller one, two million pound uh, design jobs. This was managing what became a um, 150 million pound EPC contract for an FPSO um, and was the deputy on that project. That in itself shifted a lot of my focus and how I operated. Um, unfortunately, that company, due to a downturn in the market, uh, massively struggled and the site closed. Uh, I then found myself in a couple of different roles, including a and in the Tyne at the repair ship facility, which is just across the water from where I currently sit. Yep. Uh, I mean, in the last seven years, my last three offices are about 300 yards apart, but <laughs> anything between 20 and 40 minutes extra drive, depending on which office you're talking about. Um, within that environment, I realised I, I had my first child at the time, who was young, and I was missing a lot of her growing up in the first year of her life and decided that the life balance wasn't right and I needed to get back on a career path. Um, an opportunity came within Soil Machine Dynamics for lead project manager, which is when I joined. The next couple of years resulted in the MD of that business leaving and me being promoted into my boss's role and him taking the MD's role. The following year, he left. And I was then asked whether to take an interim charge in the service business, um, which gives me a lot of pleasure because I ultimately had been in the business about three years, but the seniors in the business could see that um, I understood what service was about and uh, had the potential to actually lead and drive this service business forward. Um, and ultimately, from a service perspective, when I joined in 2017, our turnover was a little over 11 million for services. Um, last year, we'd done 23.3 million, and this year, we're probably going to be doing over 30. Oh. So hopefully I think their trust in me is actually starting to come up with the four. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, a, if you like, my journey to get to where I am. I think along that way, every role has added to, I guess, my tool set. Yeah. Um, and that's for, right from my time in Babcock latterly allowed me to explore a lot of the business development and what's required to substantiate business decisions and investment. Um Right through to the time in a and I've had a lot of angry clients because of the nature of the environment. 
um, the pressure of the environment that I'm able to take a fairly balanced view on things now. Um, when clients are upset, somebody once reminded me in the middle of a job at that particular role that nobody's died, Liam. Nobody's died. Yeah, yeah, perspective. Which, absolutely. Um, so hopefully I'm able to kind of impart some of that back to my team when they feel really panicked and stressed about a client's big issue. Um, and that's not that you take the foot off and you're complacent, but it's like we are where we are. We need to think about what's the what's the problem, what's the right route to the solution, what's the most effective way to get them what they need as quickly as they can. And sometimes that actually is about telling people bad news that what you've asked for is not achievable. Um, but here, what is achievable in a realistic time scale, et cetera. So I, the, definitely the, the journey I've been on has been interesting. Um, and ultimately, like most people, has shaped my views and how I operate today. 100%. But I think the, the, the plan, I've never had a plan. Um, I just like to challenge myself. I like to prove myself. I like to think that when I accept a challenge that I, I don't fail on them. I don't think I've necessarily willingly failed on in many things in my life. Um, and I guess it's uh, somebody has recently said to me that I have high energy. Um, I've had a discussion with somebody more recently about I sit in my comfort zone a lot and I've explained to them that I absolutely sit outside my comfort zone most days of my life. <laughs> yeah. Um, as an example, I've recently started up an under girls, under ten girls football team, so that my daughter has a pathway to get all girl football. Um, I, I've coached triathlon uh, for a number of years, but it's all been adults. I've never coached football. Yes, I know a fair amount about football, but it's a whole different thing when you need to coach it, and it's loads of screaming nine and ten year olds <laughs> trying to get their attention, etc. And that's massively outside of my comfort zone. Um, but I think if you don't push yourself, you then you, ultimately you're never going to achieve things. And I think you've you've proven that in your career, like you say that sometimes you've got you just got to go for those opportunities, and there'll be an element of I'll work it out when I'm there. And yeah. do you know what I mean? And and I think that's what good leaders do. The I'm really interested. You said right at the start of that that one the one of your motivations was just getting a position to change the things that frustrated you when you were on yep. the shop floor. And I think that's probably the difference between people who are quite happy just almost being frustrated by that, you know, almost accepting that that's part of the part of their role versus someone who goes, I want to, I want to push myself out of my comfort zone so I can actually come and fix this. I, I think that's almost a born mentality. Do you think that was something that you've taken inspiration from someone growing up that was something that was built into you at a very early age or where did you get that from um i don't know the i've kind of thought about that, that if you like i don't have any single points of inspiration if you like or a single person that yeah. was the inspiration um and i guess if i boil it down i think fundamentally i grew up in a household where if something wasn't right, you were kind of encouraged to do something about it. Yep. So one of the things that I've worked quite hard on in over the last number of years is I don't think I'm a very empathetic person because and I, I think in part it's because I'm a very logical thinker. I think about the problem and then I get to a solution. Yep. And a good few years by I remember my wife saying to me that Liam, I'm not asking for you to tell me the solution to this problem. I just want you to give me a, a hug and tell me it'll be okay. And that helped me, I guess, in this journey about empathy. And part of it, and it's not that my parents weren't empathetic, because they absolutely were. Um, but I think they've obviously massively shaped how I think. Um, and it was very much, well, that's a problem. What are you going to do? You know, change it. Uh, and it was very much, well, certainly in my mind, I have this view that if you keep reiterating the upset about a problem, you've got two choices. You either accept it and maybe just keep whinging, or you take a different course of action. And I think one of the things I've, in the last couple of years, found a few different quotes, and Henry Ford's uh, one of those, 
And it's if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. For me, this is very much kind of a ties back to um, almost basic physics. There are some things you cannot change in life, but there's some things that you can. You know, um, if I boil it right back, I recall the first physics session I ever had at school, and it was chatting about um, when you push a, a wall, if that doesn't have an opposite and equal uh, reaction force, it will fall over. That made absolute sense to me. For lots of people, even as adults, they just don't, how can a wall have energy? Come on, that's crazy. Um, but I've, I think, always try, kind of lived with this. Well, if you don't change something, why do you expect the outcome to be different? Um, and certainly my last few roles, uh, I use analogies like if you were on the school uh, playground as a kid and a kid came up to hit you, they might hit you the first time, but the next time they come up, if you're if you're sensible, you'll take a course, different courses of action. You'll either maybe hit them first, probably the wrong thing. You might run away. At the very least, you should put your hands up because you know that kid's going to try and clout you. The one thing you're not going to do is just stand and let them put one on your chin as you did the first time. Same as all. And as a result of that, and, and there's loads of different analogies you can use, but ultimately, I think that's shaped a lot of my thinking. It's just that, you know, don't just accept what's happening. Try and help change it. And if you can't change it, then you need to, if you can't change the thing, then maybe you need to change the environment that you're in by taking yourself away from it. Um, and certainly that's advice I've passed to a few people that have been close to me that when they've been unhappy in the roles, et cetera, is if you can't influence in this and put a solution in place, then it probably is time to think about changing where you work so that you get that different environment where you are able to flourish and help shape things and change things. Yeah, 100%. Getting back to what you said right at the start regarding, and I agree completely, that there's a big difference between a manager and a leader. Do you think yeah. you can train to become a leader if you are a if you're a manager but don't see yourself in that role? I think absolutely. Um, I'm currently undertaking a fair amount of leadership coaching. Now, some might argue that I've got some leadership skills. Um, I'm in a kind of a second iteration, we're a couple of years apart. And as part of that process, there's a an excess of a dozen peers at all different levels within the organisation have put forward their responses to a series of questions. And the shift in responses from two years ago, um, that's I don't that's not a coincidence. It's not about lots of them are the same people, but the responses are different because of the behaviours that I now demonstrate. So as an example, um, I have a couple of things playing against me of when I, I'm, I'm quite a passionate person I'm from near Glasgow. When Glaswegians get passionate, it sounds very close to being an angry person. <laughs> yeah. Um, and can often be confused for that. But equally, because I'm passionate, um, and I truly believe in things, when I convey an opinion that disagrees with someone else's, it probably is aggression, because in my mind, they're wrong, I am right. Yep. Now, I think with that, that's one of the aspects of my leadership that I'm working on. I need to temper that. Um, and leadership sometimes isn't always about doing more of something. Sometimes it's actually about doing less. Um, and as part of that whole mentoring and coaching, we identify areas where in the past I thought I was very um, less autocratic in how I manage and lead than other people uh, had the view of. It's turned out this time around, I think I'm much more dictatorial than other people view me to be. Huh. And that's flipped on its head which would suggest that I've put work and effort into that to try and give more people the autonomy to do, make their own decisions and take find their own paths. Um, so I absolutely think you can help coach and train people. Um, engineering is dependent on the engineering environment. Several environments I've worked in, um, where it's been, for, for instance, a fabrication shop, typically the, the operations manager has probably been promoted up through to be the lead welder. He's the best welder. 
But what often doesn't happen is they don't then provide the training and knowledge base in coaching Absolutely. to shape them to the people side of things. Yep. So they will know the best process and way to do that. But how do you make that happen in the most efficient, effective way? And ultimately, you end up working in environments where that person has got a whole host of nicknames that none of them are nice. Yeah, yeah. And, and very few people have respect for that person. Um, I've also been looking, working in places where some of those people have had a lot of respect. They've maybe not been the best leaders, but they're definitely really good managers. And I guess, depending on where you sit in the organisation, you need really good managers in businesses. You don't need a thousand leaders. Um, but I think if everybody can show a bit more on the leadership side of things and understand leadership, then it actually helps the collective. Apologies for interrupting this podcast for a very quick 30 second pitch of my business. Theo James are a specialist manufacturing and engineering recruitment search firm based in Seaham in the Northeast. If you're looking for any staff or a new opportunity yourself, from a semi-skilled level right the way up to C-suite executive, then please get in touch. We have a specialist consultant in each discipline ready to help. I'm extremely proud of what we've built over the years and I'd love to extend that service out to you. Thank you. Enjoy the podcast. Yeah, I think and you hit the nail on the head there. I think in every industry I've ever seen or worked in, the mistake companies make is they promote people because they've been successful in, in a trade or whatever they're doing and just presume that that person will be able to transfer the, that skill set into leadership. And it is polar opposites, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Polar opposites. And and Aye. it just leads to that person becoming uncomfortable. And, and, and I've gone through that myself. Just And it's a, it's an ego. It's a lovely feeling to go, they're trusting me to be a manager. But then without the tools to actually manage and, and enable people, facilitate that environment, it's it's a really lonely place. And it's... yeah. It's not their fault then that they get nicknames. It's, no, absolutely. It's and then all of a sudden they're unsuccessful and the pressure comes on them. And then they find that, I don't know, perhaps that actually they're not the best person under pressure. Yeah. Um, I've been very fortunate because of the structure with the Ministry of Defence early part of my career. I had a lot of training in, uh, provided to me for a whole diff- host of different things. Similarly, within Babcock, they really invest in the people. So I was part of what they would refer to as the big academy. It's a kind of a shortened version of, a, of an MBA. And it was done in conjunction with Strathclyde Uni. Um, and it was during, I guess, part of that uh, course, where I think it was four one-week uh, spells on site, where we look at a variety of different things to do with business. But I stepped in because our divisional MD wasn't able to, uh, to undertake that at that particular time. So I sat in a room as the only non-director from the business sitting in this course. And I remember saying after the first week, coming home and saying to my wife, she was asking, how was it? And just saying, you know what, Rach, I, I, I can be one of these people. And she was asking, well, what do you mean? I'm that there was some really clever people there. And I, th- there's none of them that's like way up here. There's, they've came from similar backgrounds to me. Um, I did similar journeys in terms of management. They've just shown willing and they've been successful in doing what they do because of how they've shaped themselves. And it really made me realise that actually you can be the best version of yourself with input from, but it does require input from others. Um, And I think a big part of leadership is, and I guess it's what I'm trying to learn through the coaching, fundamentally it's about self-reflection. It's about understanding what you do, how that affects others, how they respond to that, what they do as a result of it, and whether it was a good or bad thing and weighing up, did I make the same response? Should I be put in that situation again, or do I make a different response and try and invoke a different response from the, the people that you're involved with? Um, and I guess it's probably a liken to um, kind of an enlightenment, if you like. We're, we're all trying to get to this higher level of thinking, but in actual fact, for me, it's about helping others unlock their levels of thinking because we're definitely stronger as the sum of the parts. Yeah, I um, think. Sorry, as you were gone. No, no, that was a, a, the, the point I wanted to make. In it is to say that it's, it is back to the my old boss. Well, I'm not the only person paid to think in this room. <laughs> yeah, Twelve yeah. heads are better than one. But what we need to do is have a concerted or a structured way that we channel all that thinking and get a conclusion that we think is the right 
inclusion by consensus and then move it forward in a, a very efficient and effective way. Rather, otherwise, managing by committee is painful. Yeah, 100%. I really like what you said there about self-reflection as well, because I really agree. And, and, and that was a realisation for me that I don't do any self-reflection. And when you do, it's quite powerful. Do you, is that something you you religiously do? Is it something you've got a strategy for? How, how, how have you done that, which has helped? Um, so I live minimum 45 minutes away from work. I live out in uh, rural Northumberland. Nice. So I, I operate four days a week in the office. So I have a fair amount of time in the car myself. Um, I often find myself getting to the end of the A69 heading to work. And realizing that, for instance, my wife's been in the car the day before and changed the channel, and it's not the channel I listen to. Such as the, it's just noise. So yeah, I spend yeah. a lot of time thinking about either the day ahead, the challenges that I'm trying to face and that I'm trying to work around. Um, and I think the reflection part, I find myself at times in the shower at night thinking, you know what, I, that response done there. And, and I've tried to, I guess, utilize it in my life outside of work as well um sometimes i just said to a colleague earlier sometimes it's easier just to say sorry for my part in that yeah because it moves it forward quicker than both being stubborn and kind of obstinate and that's very true in a work environment we often don't have share the same views or opinions as our colleagues but if we all have a sense of purpose that is common or that at least other people understand what our own sense of purpose is. And for me, it's very much about um, service and support and adding true value to our clients. Um, and the reason I say that is in the, the current business that I'm in context is our clients pay a lot of money for our equipments and for the services and parts that they buy from us. It's how we generate a revenue. Well, I think it's only fair that they receive an equal level of service. Yeah. And, the, I think with that, if we can all have that sense of purpose, then actually all the other little things that happen and the upsets and disappointments, they're trivial and actually unimportant. Because if we've got that common sense of purpose, we all strive towards the same end goal. Um, a years ago, I used to, in the early part of my career, would try to say, it used to frustrate me that you'd, um, within an MOD world with projects, you have maybe got four or five different, completely different entities who are all generating the revenue from their own part. Um, but ultimately, you end up with lots of conflicts in there because somebody's trying to do this because they're trying to get a piece of the pie. And, and I used to regularly say, folks, if we all have the same end goal, ultimately, all our nests will be feathered because Achieving the end goal, the end goal is what will get all of you guys your revenue. Yeah. If we don't get that, then I'm not going to sign off all the checks as yeah. the purse holder. Um, which in lots of ways, I had an old MD at that time. It was the one of the first contracts I ran for a support contract, and his comment out of the meeting was, "Liam, you're a breath of fresh air, lad." And I'd expressed we were talking about something where there was a lot of cost involved, and somebody was trying to explain why another project was paying for lots of it. And I put it in simple terms of that. If I go to a shop and I have 10 pence in my pocket and something is 15 pence, that's expensive because I've only got 10. And I'm, I'm telling you now, guys, my pockets are fairly empty. Um, and for him, he was, this MD was saying, if you can tell me what that budget is available, I'll advise you what I think the best thing for what you're trying to achieve, where you should put it. Um, and in time, this was a guy that... Um, I had to start saying to him, can you stop doing repairs free of charge when the guys drop into your site because you're near one of the depots? Yeah, yeah. Ah, but I just want to help. And I'm like, no, but you're, you're damaging the overall picture because I no longer get the budget for that repair yeah. next year. And everybody thinks I'm doing a great job pushing the, the cost in when it's not, it's that you're doing more for less. Yeah, yeah. So it's all these little things I think that absolutely have contributed towards um, some of that sense of purpose that I have. Yeah. You know, let's all focus on what, the, what we're actually trying to achieve and if we all do that wherever you sit and the business I'm in at the moment whether you're a tier 1, tier 2, tier 3, tier 4 if we all align to that and we work in harmony then we will all achieve our own objectives as a business 
and and and, and there lies the vision that a leader uh, absolutely has. yeah my my business earns money when our clients equipment is operating and earning them money if that's not happening i don't earn money yeah so you're uh, absolutely so what would be the solution in that let's try and make their equipment work for more and longer between failures and breakdowns and repairs and maintenance yeah. um, and make it more efficient because if they're earning then it's adding value to them doing the thing they're doing and they're adding value to their client yeah. so it's it's just a big business ecosystem isn't it 100 percent. you've obviously worked with a uh, some brilliant businesses who've invested in you as well and obviously where you are now they're investing in you despite the fact you're a very experienced manager they're still investing in it and getting into that next next level, which is brilliant. And 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 some companies or some people don't maybe have the luxury of that. You know, there's not in the budget or whatever. So there'd be people sat there in that situation we've just talked about where they they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel confident as a leader, but they found themselves in the role. What advice would you have for someone who is in that capacity in it and is is a an unconfident and quite anxious leader based on where they're at now? Um, I think a couple of pieces of advice. Um, the first is probably try and build a team that you trust and have belief in. Um, I'm really lucky that I've inherited a good team. We've also built some of that team as well in the years that I've been here. Um, fundamentally, I think a lot of it comes down to confidence and showing that confidence. And this was part of the chat I was having with a colleague when they were challenging the fact that I'm in my comfort zone all the time. And now, but as a leader, if I convey that I'm uncomfortable, what are the rest of the team thinking and the nervousness that that brings? So there's definitely a, um, an element about the external perception people have of you yeah. um, and how you convey yourself, because that has a massive influence, I think, on people. The other part is definitely about that self-reflection. Um, whilst I've had access to a lot of training, as you mentioned, and I've talked about, um, I think actually a lot of it's my observation skills, watching others and learning not just from my mistakes, but learn from theirs. Um, we've just had a young chap in the team uh, as part of his development review, and I've explained to him, I don't want you to be the next Joe Bloggs or... Alan Smith, I want you to be the best version of you that you can be. What I hope is that you observe what they do and I'll give you access to working with those people and take the good things that they do and be very dismissive of the bad things that you don't like and try and find somebody that actually does the thing they do badly well and use the way that they do it. Um, so I just be mindful that the way that you come across to people as an influence in how they act. Um, I think B, what I'm learning recently is whilst you as a leader need to have a clear view as to where you want to go, um, I recently used in one of my coaching sessions a phrase, um, I just want everybody to think like me. And I was picked up on that instantly. Um, and it's not actually what I mean. I want everybody to form good decision-making processes. And I'd like them to be able to get to a logical conclusion in the way that they need to do it. And that isn't just thinking like me, because we can't, we don't want a world to just leave us. That would be a horrific world. <laughs> um, we need, I think variety is what makes the world an exciting place with regards to people. If we were all the same, it would just be pretty boring. So, Try and reflect on what you do and what you see as the reactions and actions that come from that and try to learn from what worked, what didn't. Yeah. Um, try and convey yourself with a level of confidence. And I know that I remember as part of an early training uh, programme I was involved with, we talked about confidence. You can't necessarily teach somebody to be confident, but what you can teach them is to be assertive. Yeah. And that's a different skill set. And from that assertiveness, people take it as a sign of confidence and hopefully in time if you're being assertive you see the results and you see that it's working that in turn builds confidence because ultimately confidence is something that comes from within absolutely um, and i think it, it lends itself to some things that i've read in the past um talk about leaders and managers and the difference um i think in football 
managers is completely the wrong title for them. And I'll go on things like, uh, having read years ago Alex Ferguson's book, what he was very good at was building confidence in his players because he recognised that the most confident striker out in the field is the person that's going to be successful because football players are very much a confidence game. Um, and I recall an interview with Gordon Strachan, I think it was, who was playing for Aberdeen, that Sir Alex was the manager at the time. And I'm saying that every week, if he'd call him in the qu- corridor, I know you're only short wee lad, but you're my best striker. You're my best player in the park. He so said it, it took him three years to work out. He was doing the same to John Hewitt and always the rest of the team. Yeah, yeah. And I can only imagine people like Pep Guardiola and others, because of the success they, they bring on the field, have that ability as well. Yeah. And it's about that back to the whole inspiring that team, you know, that they want to go out of the trench and fight for that person that's behind them. And I guess that's where it becomes a two-way street. It's the honesty, integrity part. If you're honest and you've got that integrity you and you demonstrate it, your team know that you have their back um, and that you're their first in business, you're their first line of defence if there's problems yep. and you try to offer some of that. Um because ultimately, I think football managers, they're actually some of the best leaders in the sporting world, obviously. Um, and it's not just football, but they're actually leaders, not necessarily managers. And I think a good leader has to have a bit of both. 100%. 100%. And, and I really love what you said about confidence there, because I really I completely agree. It's, it's quite apt. Some One of my staff asked me this week, how do we get confident in this? And I, I said, you've got to, you've got to lead with action. Do you know what I mean? Confidence is, it has to become a match from first because you can't just, it isn't necessarily a, something you can just switch on and be confident. I, I, I ran a couple of round tables recently with, you know, 15 leaders and I was reading it. I wasn't confident going in because I'd never done it before. But I've got the third one we've ever done in, in a week's time and I, f- I feel much more confident about it. But it's just, it's just from practice, isn't it? And then you become... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It's back to like, when I was saying about the football team that I started. So I've coached um, triathlon for probably eight or so years. I could turn, if somebody said, Liam, you need to take this run session tonight, I could turn up, have no plan in place and take a good session. Yeah. Because I've got all the knowledge base of what the things we can do. And um, in the football environment, it is because I've not coached it and I've not been there, despite the fact I've watched years of drills and been involved in them, when you actually have to think about, right, um, certainly the, the, what's been put to me in my coaching training that I've just been doing is try and take a theme from the match that you've just watched and carry it through for the whole of the week so for my team at the weekend we had a bit of chat and we chatted about it. a lot of it's about organisation because they're all new to it some of the girls that until two weeks ago have never played a match mm-hmm. um, so tonight's session that I'll be taking we're going to do some drills that will help instill where they should be on the park and what is the and we'll introduce it in a fun way that if you veer out of that area, you're limited in your touches. You can only touch it three times, and you must get back to your area quickly. If yep. you're in your own area, you can play as many touches as you want. So you can introduce it through some fun and stuff. Um, but that's a, I am absolutely not confident. Yeah, yeah. I make it to the kids, and they may think he's dead confident, but I'm having to spend a lot of time looking into what how do I make that happen. What's the best way for it? I've already done lots of things that I know that I'll just never do again. Yeah. <laughs> because I tried it. Last week, I tried to cram too much into a session and thought that the, the message was lost there. It was absolutely, they all walked away tired and thinking, great, that was a great session. But for me, we were only trying to work on shooting last week. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I made it too complicated for them. And what's fascinating is that what you're doing there is going to make you a better leader in your services vision, which yeah. is which is amazing, really, how, how that transfer and that's the beauty of management that people are fearful they haven't had the training and I think training massively helps but actually it's just drawing on all the experience you've got Absolutely. to manage. I think for me training I've always uh, described it is it provides a structured way to shape a set of information and uh, facts into a concise period of time because ultimately, lots of the training courses that if anybody's ever been in one, you think, you know what, I knew most of that. Yeah. Or oh, actually, there was some really good things from that. I knew very little of it. But without that training, 
you might need to go and work in an environment for 10 years to get all that knowledge base that's right. been condensed into that short period that the training course is delivered in. Yep. Um, so ultimately, it's, I think, just a structured way to try and provide you with some understanding and experience, uh, from where you don't have the experience. 100%. I, I want to um, ask you a question, if you don't mind, which, what your opinion on this? Because if you look at manufacturing and engineering now, you look at s and is a good example, you know, yep. Fascinating industry, an industry people people want to get into. However, it's still an industry where there's a there's a shortage of a skill set, and it's probably going to be an in, increasing shortage as as sort of time goes on. You mentioned obviously right to start your career, you were didn't tell you to give much of a choice, which is very very similar to so many people I've had on here who are good leaders, where they were basically thrust an opportunity by the parents typically and said, "Look, here you go," and that was it, and that was the way things were. I think generations yeah. have changed a lot, and I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got two kids, and, and they're not old enough yet to be me to give them those options. But I know for a fact when when they get that stage, they're gonna they're gonna resist, and they're gonna be they're gonna want to do different things. I imagine, and I think yeah. that's that's changed over time. Do you think that's a real big concern for manufacturing engineering that these industries aren't as attractive as they once were, and there's too too much choice now for kids? I think. Um... It is absolutely a problem. Um, I could cite several examples. Um, during COVID um, or post-COVID, um, people working offshore, yep. there's a massive resource gap there. Um, I think that in part has been driven by a lot of people in the um, offshore world during COVID got comfortable living at home, possibly a bit further on in their careers, um, towards the back end of their careers, mortgages paid, et cetera. Why do I want to be away from the family, et cetera? I'm quite enjoying living at home. So that's created a bit of a gap. Um, and that's one example where we absolutely have a problem. Um, on the flip side, we're working at the moment and try to push some, we've got a number of equipment out in Brazil. And one of our clients is uh, starting to experience a real shortage in the ROV operators, so the pilots that control these vehicles. And it's probably in part driven by the first thing that I talked about, because people have left the industry, they would have just flown them in previously. But what they're starting to realise is that there's a real synergy, or the question they've been asking is, is there real synergy between young kids and gaming mm -hmm. and piloting these ROVs? Yeah. So, and it plays to a lot of the strengths that SMD have. So part of our uh, technology roadmap, roadmap, which we've just uh, been on show up in Aberdeen a couple of weeks ago with is we've just brought in a new electric vehicle but we also have Horizon which ultimately is about remote piloting yeah. which also has the ability to use as uh, training and simulation but some of the thinking in Brazil now is do we actually have three shifts of kids who come in and work for eight hours each sit in a big comfy chair, pilot that for eight hours and go home because try to convince kids, is, I think, as you say, with all the options they have, that you can earn a good living, but you have to live away off on a ship. Yeah. And it's pretty tough and it's a different lifestyle. Yeah. I think that's a hard sell. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be different ways that we think about how we fix those problems. Um, another example is we absolutely know that there's a, a shortage of electrical technicians and electrical engineers, certainly in the Northeast. I think it's UK wide. Yeah. Um, but in order to react to these things, you can either continue to try and play in the job markets that you sit in and you're competing with all the people that are competing, or you can start to say, I, I, you need to take control of some of your own destiny, destiny and put some of your own training programs in place. Yeah. Now, unfortunately for some companies, that that's maybe an investment that they're unable to put there. Um, equally, as a company that maybe wants to invest there, you run the risk that you're actually training people for other companies because... Yep. Some people's policies are that we'll just simply pay people a bit more and that how you attract them, etc. So we are certainly working through some of those problems at the moment as a business. How do you retain people but also attract them into the business in the first place? Yeah. Um, and simply paying them more money isn't always the answer. No. Um, because and that's why as a business we're very focused on the people side of things. So we have an engage an employee engagement forum that sits monthly to talk about what really means what's important to them. Yeah. You know, because um, I think if you can create a, a good working culture, 
and be an employer of choice for an employee, then you've got quite a lot of the boxes ticked already. But it's not easy to achieve that. So I, I think there's definitely different ways that different industries maybe can and will approach those problems. But it is absolutely a real problem that I think across manufacturing in general, um, in the, the days of my dad was a welder and he got us a job in his factory, that they're gone because those uh -huh. kids are into lots of, they're on Facebook, they're, they're yeah. on social media. Um, they know some of the other things that are out there that they could be doing. So why do I want to go and do that job versus this when that sounds more glamorous and more exciting? 100%. And, and the time it takes to build up a career in that, to earn that versus someone wants to be an influencer or, or whatever, it's Instagram. It, it's, Absolutely. it's scary. It is scary. I, I, I mean, I sound like an old man, but I, I'm, I just think the generation aren't as resilient and less resilient every single generation, every yeah. single time. And that, that's a concern. I think something needs to change there because, you know, these are really good skilled jobs. You know, we talk about AI and robotics. I think that can be an advantage for mm -hmm. people because I think it can be an attractive Ooh. prospect. Yeah. Too. And I, I share your concerns that you've voiced there. Um, it, when you look at an influencer, I don't really know how they generate a revenue truly, um, but I just think like, these people are so wealthy. How have they managed to do this when they have zero skill set from what yeah. I can see? Uh -huh. They clearly have a skill set because they've seen a niche and they've seen a market and maybe they're actually the better business person than I am. Um, but for me, it's actually has the potential to start to damage and break down um, a lot of the other fundamentals that we require in life, such as manufacturing, etc. Um, and it's great that these influencers, ultimately, there will be products that they're trying to push, etc. But if everybody's an influencer, well, who's who's making the product? Who's designing the product? Yeah, who, who's you getting this by? Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. I certainly have that same uh, worry. Yeah. It might be because I'm. I'm bit older and for a different generation to the kids that are coming into the world now in employment. Um, uh, maybe it's me that's a dinosaur and yourself. <laughs> I think it's one of those, but it, something has to give. And I think you're right. It has to start from training. It has to start from attracting them, giving them a reason why, vision, purpose, all that, about why they should work for a business like an SMD and so on. So, and I think a company like SMD is a good example where it's – the vision there is relative is, is obvious in terms of this is where the industry is going. These this is yeah. it's visually very exciting. To, I mean, the first time I walked around that site probably ten years ago, I was like, "This is unbelievable." Do you know yes. what I mean? And, and I think that that's the stuff that where companies I think need to to keep pushing on and, and to keep promoting because otherwise it's going to be the gaps is going to going to widen. It is, and I think um, publicity is definitely a big part of that in marketing. Yes. Um, Partly some prep for this, I was looking, because I think when we chatted a couple of weeks ago, we I touched on people's perception that all the data in the world goes via satellites. Yeah. So what else I couldn't find explicit data on that? Um, to give people an understanding, the US to EU data business is a £7 trillion business. So there is, and it's predominantly pushed through cables in the seabed. So that's data equates to a far greater value than actual product across the Atlantic. Because I think with the figures I looked at, you're looking at something like a 700 uh, billion business in product exchange, if you like, import-export from the US side. That data is just so imperative to most of what everybody does these days. Yeah. And the bulk of that seven trillion is we're talking about. That's how much data is transferred on the internet every day across the Atlantic. Yep. Um, so that, that per annum just becomes it's like what a phenomenal sized business. <laughs> um, and if you don't know that, most people just think, well, how do most people think that they get information on their phones? You know, the, um, the, the, the education piece, it, isn't it? It blew my mind because I hadn't thought about it, and I've been an engineer since I was sixteen. Yeah. Um, but unless you're exposed to it, and that's where I think the the publicity and marketing side of things um, is really important. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, normally, yeah, well, there's some quick fire questions which I typically give written yep. down, but I haven't written them down, so I'll have to try and I'll have to try and think of these off the cuff. But I've done them longer now, so I should be able to think of most of them. But this has been great. I really appreciate Liam. So, some quick fire questions. Yep. Three words which make up 
a good leader? First things that come come to come to your mind. Uh, honesty. Yep. Integrity. Inspire. Love it. Any in- inspiration for you? You're not you're not allowed, Alex Ferguson, which is uh, from the sport in business, famous world, whatever. Anything that you ever, anyone you've ever been inspired by or t- taken inspiration from? Uh, um. I think any sports personality, if it's from a sporting world, who has faced adversity and challenge and succeeded, um, there's probably too many to name. It could be the UK's number one uh, wheelchair tennis champion. Um, I, I think that shows true strength of character. Um, and I think they are inspirational. And from my own experience, triathlon-wise, Anyone who puts themselves out there, sport and exercise wise, is inspirational. Yeah, and that could be the person that's out starting their couch to five k today because and I've never run for twenty years, um, because that's showing some get up and go, and that's why I find inspiration. Completely agree. They did. I did a great enough run last week, which was brutal heat wise, but they oh, well done. Thanks, Ben. The, the hundred and five year old that did it. Do you know what I mean? I took more inspiration than him. It's just unbelievable because yeah. how would you need to at that age? You, you know what I mean? So, but- uh, I have a coach in triathlon who, when I asked him at the start of last season, his objectives for the year, it was to achieve uh, qualification for a couple of European championships for his age group. Uh, he qualified for both European and world championships for the things he was uh, putting himself out to do. Um, and he's in his early 70s. And he's just, and I just think, you know what? Wicked, you're out there doing it. 100%. One life, yeah. Absolutely. Love it. Um, best book or audio book, podcast that you've listened to, watched, that's worth a mention, that you'd recommend? Um, Apart from this one. I'm actually currently reading a book. I've not finished it. Um, and this is a bit of a shout out to somebody that um, I coach and is the chair of uh, Triathlon Club. Um, it's a book by Justin Turner. And it's called Science in Business. And from what I've realised by reading probably about a third of it so far is we are so more alike than I realised. And ultimately, it's about how science is all around us in business. And whilst you, um, to use the phrase analysis, is uh, over-analysis is paralysis, analysis should be used for making any decision. It has to be tempered based upon what the decision is and what time you've got available, etc. Um, but I uh, science and business by Justin uh, Turner. Excellent. I'll I'll look up and uh, and just next 12, 18 months SMD tremendous business. But what what's the what's the plans next sort of uh, um, years? So for ourselves, it's very much about our continued growth. We did have a period where the the markets weren't necessarily in favour for us, and we had a few tough years. Um, last year was uh, a promising year for us. This year is looking to be more so. Um, we're just in the process of revising what our strategic objectives are, but it's very much about growing the business. Um, and ultimately, certainly from a service perspective, truly trying to add value to our clients by offering a world-class service and aligning the business internally to deliver that. Um, a lot of challenges there because we have a lot of moving parts to that and we need everybody to be aligned and try to get to the end goal um, ultimately for SMD realistically in the next seven years, six years we want to triple the size of our business wow. for the UK um, and we think that's very achievable so that's where the work is going at the moment to try and make that growth a reality Right, uh, really exciting look and uh, really appreciate Liam, I've really enjoyed it and, and- I always have a bit of a takeaway at the end of these podcasts because it's a class. It's free training for me for an hour, and, and it really has been. And, and you know what? What I've loved is someone like yourself as well, which someone could be forgiven to looking at your CV if you like and going, "Ministry of Defence, unionised environment." You know, so I guess stereotypically people will be quite sort of dictatorship stuck in a way. You are the opposite to that. Someone who is. I love the fact we talk about self reflection, being a leader, vision. Someone who's still working on their own skill set as a leader now, however many years on. And I think um, so many lessons that I've taken, so many people can take. And yeah, just a real good management inspiration one where I just, yeah, there's tangible things people can listen here and and, and change today. So uh, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. 
And I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just on that old reflection piece that um, it's back to the, if you always do what you've always done. I just, I often think the world would be a much better place if we were all, all a little bit better in, in, as a, an individual level. But if we don't try to aspire to be better, how are we going to be better? It's not just going to happen itself. Um, otherwise, we'll just keep getting what we've got. Um, so I, I the, my note to end there would be, if we, in a, if we can make the world, or if we can make 1% difference, it's 1% better than it was yesterday. 100%. Thank you so much, Liam. Appreciate that. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for your time.